Uh, first and foremost, everybody will be muted during the webinar just to avoid any background noise or interruptions. Um, secondarily, there will be some poll questions that are going to show up during the webinar. Uh, there's going to be three of them total, so if you wouldn't mind please answering uh, the quick poll questions as they arrive, that would be wonderful. So uh, a little bit about Dr. Pohl. He's a medical director at Mission Valley Medical Clinic, which is an urgent care and occupational med medicine clinic. And he has practiced in San Diego since 1980. He was awarded the Charlie Joyner Winning Spirit Award in 2007. He's also a board certified occupational med medical practitioner, a qualified medical examiner, and a utilization review specialist. He received his medical degree from Sunny Buffalo in 1972. Thank you, Dr. Fole, for being our guest presenter today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, we'll try to be uh, informative today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about workers' compensation. Uh, wor workers' compensation 101 is the name of the uh, talk. Uh, from an objective standpoint, I'd like for you all to have an increased understanding of the uh, work comp system. Uh, I'd like to increase patience for you from referrals of satisfied injured workers and satisfied employers. And I'd like you to have a comfort level in treating the injured workers. I don't know what your background is, if you do a little bit of work comp, a lot of work comp, but I'm going to just give you an overview uh, from 20 years of experience. The topic of workers' compensation has different connotations to the employer, the injured employee, and the doctor. Uh, the employer it wants to keep costs down and have efficient management uh, and get his employee back to work. The injured worker, sometimes it, it feels um, uh, he feels nervous about it. He feels embarrassed that uh, he's not working. There's considerations of loss of wages um, and is uh, somewhat concerned about going to the company doctor or the work comp doctor. Uh, the uh, the doctor, uh, sometimes like ourselves, will attribute negative feelings towards this discipline, and this is due to under misunderstandings and stereotypes that are often perceived. Uh, the early work comp history, uh, there are benefits to the employer and the employee. Uh, it's kind of a trade-off. The employer uh, must cover all workers' compensation costs uh, from a standpoint of treatment and uh, other issues such as that. The employee uh, uh, gets complete medical treatment, but in, in, in lieu of that, does not, is not able to sue the employer for pain and suffering and those types of things. Uh, just a little bit about the structure of the uh, workers' compensation system in the United States, in the uh, California. Uh, the Division of Workers' Compensation is within the California Department of Industrial Relations. Uh, and it regulates the California workers' compensation system. There is a judicial body uh, called the California Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, uh, which handles disputed uh, issues. Uh, treating patients with work-related injuries can be challenging uh, given the various rules in the system, but can be very rewarding as we see the injured worker return to his usual customary duties. There are several types of injuries that can occur. Uh, including illnesses, and uh, the acute or specific injury uh, is, is the one that we uh, see quite often, the cumulative injury and illnesses uh, or exposures. Uh, an acute injury is, as we might think, uh, when you hurt, hurt your back, the person is lifting, bending over, hurts his back, that's, that's a, an acute injury. The cumulative injury can be a back that's been hurt over a period of time after cumulative lifting or upper extremity problem. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, that type of thing. Uh, and then, of course, there are illnesses. Uh, tuberculosis uh, would be one that uh, is an exposure. Uh, asbestosis, which you've all have heard about, uh, and even pleural mesothelioma, which is, uh, has a long latent period of 30 years. Uh, other injuries we often see, needle stick exposures, dog bites uh, in the postal workers, stress claims, uh, which uh, uh, have become less common lately, and uh, chemical exposures. Uh, the injured worker uh, presents to the physician, uh, the first priority is to um, 
focus if uh, if the injured worker is if this is work related or not. So we skip the slide here. Uh, so we have to decide whether this is work related or not, and whether it ar arose out of employment or, or in the course of employment. What we call AOE COE, and uh, the arising out of the employment there has to be a reasonable pathophysiological cause, a causal relation between the employment and the injury sustained. Regarding the course of employment, we're talking about did it happen at work? And this sometimes comes up when the employer comes in on a Monday and the injury occurred on a Friday, but he didn't report it to his employer and he could have injured himself playing basketball and hurt his back. So the employer is sometimes questioning this and they want to know if it happened at work. But we can't really state that and we can't tell if it happened during the course of employment. Uh, sometimes the injury is straightforward. Uh, the person, as I said before, the patient bends over, hurts his back. Uh, and then other instances, a mechanic who lifts, bends, and stoops on a regular basis, uh, but cannot remember the specific incident leading to the injury. Uh, another situation which might not be work-related would be that if, let's say someone has a, a knee problem and they're walking uh, at work, they, they don't climb stairs, uh, there was no acute injury, and all of a sudden they have knee pain. Well, this is harder to say that this is work-related. So in this kind of situation, I might say this is not work-related because there's no pathophysiological way that this could have occurred. Let's talk about maybe a heart attack. Okay, if someone has a heart attack at work, well, it happened at work, so it meets the, the COE the, the, during the course of employment. But as we know, there's many other factors that can cause a heart attack. Uh, in our state, there are presumptions uh, that uh, if you are a firefighter or a police officer uh, and you have a heart attack, then it is work-related. This is something that came up legally. This is not the case in uh, most other occupations, and causation is usually going to come out as negative. So let's talk about uh, the doctor's first report of injury, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the patient first describes uh, his injury or her injury, uh, and then we fill out our portion. We, we uh, fill out our subjective findings, objective findings, uh, the impression, no different than regular uh, family practice or internal medicine. Uh, and then we state, is it work-related? Now, we were talking about that in the previous slide, is it work-related or not? And then factors that inhibit healing. For example, if someone is a diabetic, and uh, they, uh, they're going to heal slower if they, or they can't take anti-inflammatories because they're diabetic uh, or they're extremely obese. Uh, so these are just things that uh, the, the factors that in, in, inhibit healing. Um, modalities of treatment uh, are similar to any other type of medicine, uh, medication, physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, etc. Uh, there's something on here, workers' comp appeal board. That's from the last slide. It's still here. It looks like that's not really relevant. So uh, I'm going to talk about some differences in the in the workers' compensation system. Uh, first of all, it, it's a little different than just dealing with a patient. You have to walk a fine line between the needs of the patient, uh, the employer, and the insurance company. Uh, the key is to facilitate efficient resolution of work-related injuries is prompt treatment and communication between the injured worker, the employer representative, and the insurance adjuster. And there are other players in here. There's nurse case managers, there's physical therapists, acupuncturists. So we all have to kind of work together. So what are the differences in the workers' compensation system? Uh, there are various concepts, so one of which I don't have down here. One is experience modification. It's very important to the employer to keep their number of injuries and the extent of their injuries down. You can't do much about the number of injuries, but you can certainly try to treat the injury and keep the cost to a minimum. And the, uh, the, the premium that the employer has to pay is based on the amount of injuries and the extent of the injuries. And it's something called an experience modifier, and, uh, and it can cost them significant dollars um, in, in, their, in their business. Uh, the next thing is uh, apportionment. Uh, let's talk a little bit of, about apportionment. I'll, I'll, I'll mention all these items. Apportionment, total temporary disability, uh, firm guidelines for utilization review, the American College of Occupational Medicine guidelines, um, maximal medical improvement, qualified medical examiners, 
utilization review, uh, MTUS guidelines, which are other guidelines for chronic injuries, uh, official disability guidelines, which if one of them doesn't cover, the other one does. And uh, the last thing I have here is the cases under investigation. So let's kind of go through these uh, one by one. Uh, let's talk about apportionment. It's, it's exactly what it says. It's a legal concept that the causation of an injury may be apportioned percentage-wise to several different etiologies. For example, let us take a case of a 60-year-old male with a history of degenerative arthritis of the lumbar spine who has several previous back surgeries from which he has never fully recovered but has been able to work as a mechanic. Suppose he has an acute injury to his lower back when he slips and falls, sustaining a low back strain. At the point that he reaches an MMI or maximal medical improvement, which I'll discuss a little later, the treating physician must make a determination about apportionment. That is, what portion of the back condition was pre-existing to the injury and what portion was attributed to the recent fall. This determination has legal and financial ramifications. Um, so this is one thing that's different in, in the system. And this has come up uh, since 2004, the concept of apportionment. And it does make sense. It's not fair that an employer should be paying for uh, the, the previous degenerative disc disease that was there before the patient bent down and lifted that item. In the workers' compensation system, uh, not only are there medical costs, but uh, there's no deductible or copay, but the injured worker is also entitled to total temporary disability payments, which is the TTD. Uh, these payments, if the, if the employee is not able to work and is not a modified duty, which we always encourage, uh, they're paid up to two thirds of their income, up to $700 per week. This differs from the private arena where the patient cannot work, where, where he may be entitled to state disability. By the way, injured worker may also apply for state, state disability on top of this uh, payment. Several years ago, the workers' compensation costs were rising at an alarming rate and were costing employers more and more money and forcing some out of business in the state. Part of these runaway costs were due to overutilization of services such as physical therapy and chiropractic. Therefore, in 2004, due to the efforts of Governor Schwarzenegger and the legislature, in an effort to stem these rising costs and the loss of business and companies to other states like Nevada, a sweeping legislation was passed, which is SB. Uh, 899. Uh, one of the most important aspects of this legislation was the institution of strict utilization review requirements. Each workers' comp insurance company that does business in California was required to have a utilization review program with physicians doing a large portion of the reviews covering such topics as physical therapy, chiropractic, MRI, surgery, epidurals, facet, injections, and the like. A cap was also instituted for chiropractic and physical therapy sessions at 24 uh, at the most. Along with these changes, there was the adoption uh, by the American College of Environmental and Occupational Medicine guidelines, the so-called ACOM guidelines, which were presumed correct. And these guidelines, uh, there's a book and there's also guidelines you get online, they stress functional restoration as indicative of reasons for approving further treatment, such as physical therapy or chiropractic Basically, there needs to be subjective and or objective improvement for treatment modality to be continued. So those of you who are asking for additional physical therapy, additional chiropractic, there needs to be documentation of these items. Physicians all over the state are making peer-to-peer -peer telephone calls, uh, which may be a pain sometimes, to determine and understand their colleagues' rationale for the particular treatment plan. And, and that's the reason for these guidelines. Other guidelines that uh, have been procreated since uh, the MTUS or medical treatment utilization uh, guidelines uh, refer to if it's more than 90 days. So they deal with a lot more issues and a lot more treatment modalities uh, and they take over where the ACOM guidelines uh, let off. And this is from 2009, so they probably need some updating. So there, there is something called the official disability guidelines, which are updated uh, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis and they cover new, new items, new types of treatments. Uh, and so we look to those also as utilization review physicians and you as treating physicians should be aware of these uh, types of issues. Uh, de depending on the body part, there are various uh, range of motion, presence of spasm, objective findings that uh, we, we look at the impairment rating um, in the AMA guides. So 
there's something called a maximal medical improvement, and physicians and other providers are required to do a permanent stationary report, which many of you may do, and determine factors such as apportionment, which we just discussed, appropriate future medical care, and most recently, impairment rating. So the impairment rating uh, uses the AMA Guides to Impairment Rating, 5th edition. And depending on the body parts, there are specific guidelines for this that I won't get into. Uh, and QMEs or AMEs, uh, Qualified Medical Examination and Medical Examiners and uh, Agreed Medical Examiners, do these reports. This, they're come, they come up with an impairment rating. Let's say there's a 10% whole body impairment rating, and then this goes to the state, and then they figure out a disability based on factors such as occupation, age, and uh, uh, and the like. Uh, this disability rating translates into a monetary payment, which sometimes is paid in bulk or more often on a every other week basis. So the QMEs are certified by the state to give second opinion if the injured worker or the employer has any disputes regarding this permanent stationary status or the MMI status. So how does this look uh, from a physician's standpoint? The physician was willing to treat injured employees can build a close relationship with both the injured employees and the group of employers. As the injured worker moves through the system and observes that you've treated him efficiently and in a caring manner, he may choose to refer friends or relatives to you. As employers have watched you treat their employees appropriately, they may choose to send other employees to you, both workers' compensation and private patients. So this could in improve your practice, one of the, the uh, objectives of my talk at the, at the outset. How does the system work from an injured worker standpoint? The injured employee is treated appropriately for his injury and is kept working, albeit with certain specific restrictions. I might add, we try to get people back to modify duty, not put them off work so that they don't form this disability mentality, the sick patient, as we all hear about. The injured worker is paid for all his medical care and does not have to worry about high deductibles, co-pays, and high hospital bills. In over 95% of the cases, the injured worker is able to return to his livelihood of gainful employment. And most injured workers are very happy uh, getting back to work, and they don't want to mess with the system and, and, and do fraudulent type of uh, behaviors. Uh, if the injured worker cannot work, he's reimbursed to some extent for his time off work. If he cannot return to his usual customary duties, which is maybe 5%, 10% of the time, the employers are given incentives to create a permanent modified duty position for the employee. If the injured worker is determined unable to return to full duty or a modified duty position, he usually receives this lump sum payment uh, based on his disability rating, as we talked about. There used to be something called vocational rehabilitation in the system. Now they have vouchers for uh, the same issues to help the injured employee get back to some type of gainful employment to help them with fees and uh, education, computers, etc. So no, this isn't a perfect system but with the cooperation of the main players, the doctors, the therapists, the insurance companies, the nurse case managers, the employers, and the patients, a fair shake is possible for all. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the new laws that have uh, come about. Uh, the Senate Bill uh, 863 was passed uh, in mid-2012 uh, uh, by Governor Brown. Each governor has their uh, little ways of trying to help the system. Sometimes, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. The utilization review system, for example, from SB 899, just seemed to delay things and people weren't getting treatment when they really needed treatment. Uh, so that's still a, still a feature. Uh, but in, in the Senate Bill uh, 863, they introduced the IMR, which you, you may or may not be hearing about. And these are uh, independent medical reviews that um, help if there's a, a denied uh, treatment by the utilization review person, let's say they deny an MRI the injured worker may request an IMR. So it goes to this IMR review uh, and uh, other physicians are hired in the state to do this and they have to make a determination within 30 days, supposedly. Now, it's not clear how this is working uh, at this time. There's also been some new changes with the utilization review process. Uh, now we have to fill out this form. It's called an RFA, Request for Treatment authorization and it, it, it kind of delays things from my experience it seems like physical therapy is taking longer to get authorized so 
you give a little, you take a little, it's kind of like Obamacare, you know, it's uh, just depends. Uh, the IMR ver physician versus the QME physician, they, they do similar things, but the QME is, is hired by the, and, and, and certified by the state. The IMR physician is, is hired by the IMRO, which is this organization that the state contracts with. And you can't be both. Uh, a few other things that uh, the uh, <clears throat> bill did, uh, they uh, have a return to work fund for, to help the injured workers return to work if their uh, permanent disability rates are pro disproportionately low. Uh, there's a supplemental job displacement voucher, which I talked about briefly, that now is capped at $6,000 to help them get it back to work, to uh, provide them with schooling, uh, computers, etc. The permanent disability payments have been increased, uh, and to decrease litigation, the, the uh, IMRs have been introduced, as I mentioned. There's going to be a new fee schedule, which takes place February 1st, uh, 2014. I wish I had more information about this. It's going to be based on the RB, RBS, kind of like Medicare, and um, we'll see how that, uh, that comes out. Um, and uh, there's also going to be independent uh, bill review. Uh, you can have your own chiropractor or acupuncturist uh, treat uh, you if you pre-designate. Uh, so these are just some of the changes that uh, have been instituted. And uh, I think we'll uh, be opening it up for questions shortly. And I'll, I'll turn this over to Dustin. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pohl. And <clears throat> if there are any questions that you have, you can go ahead and type them into the uh, GoToWebinar interface. And as they come in, we'll answer them. There's a few other slides to show here real quickly. Um, there's an article that Dr. Pohl has furnished from the uh, San Diego Physician Magazine. Um, it's again, the Workers' Comp 101, Overcoming Perceiving Misunderstandings and Stereotypes. Uh, you'll be able to click the button on there uh, we'll send out the slides for this uh, webinar tomorrow to everybody. It'll be downloadable on the Physician Resource Center website. And there's also uh, another download, which is a frequently asked question. Um, I think it's about a three or four page document. That'll also be available for, uh, for download. So if you have any, um, any questions that you'd like to type through, um, we'll go ahead and start answering them. Uh, the first one has arrived here. Are there forms to have questions where can we get them um i guess would this frequently asked question uh document answer most of those questions that they've had? uh well the, the dwc the department of workers compensation chris how are you i <laughs> long time no talk i know chris uh you can you can uh kind of google the uh, dwc and uh there i'm sure you can get the forms online uh from that we have tons of forms so if you want to email me directly uh at drpoll at missionvalleymedical.com. I'm happy to send you a copy of whatever we use. Okay, great. Thank you. Another, another question here. Uh, he, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> he says he's saying hello. Hi, Dr. Walter. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, we have a few questions to throw out of our own, which is a poll. Um, there's going to be three questions total. The first one uh, we're sending out right now. Um, and if you could just please answer yes or no on that. Okay, well, we'll send another one out here real shortly. All right, and here comes the second one. And again, if you could pick either being a specialist or a, a primary care slash internal medicine physician. Okay, thank you very much. And one last question. Either yes or no on that. Would you like to increase your uh, workers' comp population? Well, uh, while everybody's finishing up their answers, uh, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much, Dr. Paul, for being our guest today. It's a very comprehensive overview. Uh, the recording for this webinar will be available also on the Physician Resource Center website. Um, I would look for it, uh, I'd say, Friday or Monday. Uh, so we can uh, get this wrapped up and uh, available to you. Um, if there's not any more questions from anybody to type through, uh, we'll go ahead and close the webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much. And if anybody has any personal questions, you can uh, call me 619-846-8156 uh, or drpoll at missionvalleymedical.com where you can go through the website.
happy to talk to you personally. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.